my name is Linda Green. I am the uh, director here at the uh, Westford Museum, and it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you here this afternoon. Uh, before we actually get started, I just wanted to um, let you know of a couple other events that will be happening here at the uh, museum. Uh, in recognition of the uh, 250th anniversary of the uh, Boston Tea Party, uh, and last year, in October, we actually dedicated the grave site of our Westford Boston Tea Party participant here, and this kind of all evolved out of that. Uh, we're doing a, a year-long discussion on the uh, destruction of the tea. The uh, first event is Thursday, evening, March 16th, and um, it's a virtual event, and it's with um, Danielle Boudet, uh, the proprietor of the Cozy Tea Cart, and Danielle will be, discuss be discussing the discovery of tea, the impact on the early history of, of Massachusetts in the colonies, and of course the um, Boston Tea Party, and how it was all brought about by a simple cup of tea. So, what we have for you on your way out this afternoon is um, little teas um, that I hope you will pick up, scan the QR code to register to attend the event, put the rest of the um, little flyer or whatever you want on your refrigerator so you don't forget to attend the event, and brew yourself a cup of tea, sit down and join us for um, discovering the tea in the Boston Tea Party. Um, and then on March 30th, uh, which again is a Thursday night, uh, we'll be hosting Samuel Adams. We have a reenactor coming as Samuel Adams, and I honestly believe that Samuel Adams is the founder of the, Ameri well, the start of the American Revolution, and we're real excited to uh, talk with him. And then also mark on your calendars for Wednesday evening, April 19th, the true Patriots Day. Not Marathon Monday, Patriots Day. <laughs> <laughs> the true Patriots Day. Um, last year we hosted a candlelight uh, tour of Fairview Cemetery. This year we're doing West Lawn Cemetery. Um, it's going to be from 7.30 to 8.30. We'll have colonial reenactors there to talk about some of the uh, different grave sites of our, our Revolutionary War soldiers buried there. So um, we encourage you to, to come out to uh, that as well. And again, the best way to stay informed of all the events that are happening at the museum is to become a member. Uh, if you're not a member, we have membership flyers throughout the museum. Please pick one up. And, um, you know, your support goes directly towards preserving the history within these four walls as well as in our town. And it's the best thing you could do for, for the town of Westford, I think. So, um, this evening or this afternoon, we have the great pleasure of welcoming uh, Chris Gorham. And I have actually asked Sophie Sloan to uh, introduce him. And Sophie was his capstone student last year. Um, she um, helped Mr. Um, Gorham with a lot of the research. And I thought it was nobody better or more fitting then to introduce Mr. Gorham. And then we also have the uh, members of the uh, Westford Academy Museum Club, and they have got a list of questions <laughs> to ask Mr. Gorham. And then we'll do a short little uh, question and answer at the very end. So, okay. Well, I'm just honored to be here to introduce Mr. Gorham. Not only is he one of Westford Academy's best teachers, he's one of the best teachers I personally ever had. Working with him on the confidant not only just gave me such a great experience to end my high school years with, but it also introduced me to one of my personal heroes, Anna Rosenberg, who she just inspired me so much with all that she accomplished and everything. Mr. Gorham also inspired me with how much work and love and passion he put into this book. And I'm just thrilled to be a part of it. <laughs> and now for like the actual professional introduction, not just me <laughs> fangirling over here. <laughs> but Mr. Gorham holds degrees from the University of Michigan, Tufts University, and Syracuse University 
University College of Law, and after practicing law for over a decade, the last several years he has taught at Westford Academy, and he's just one of the best history teachers. I cannot stress that part enough. <laughs> Thank you, too. His writing has appeared in Washington Post, Literary Hub, Paper Brigade Daily, and online publications. The Confidant is his very first book, and it's incredible. <laughs> it's amazing. And that's enough for me. I'm going to leave it all to Mr. Gore for now. The New York Times called her one of the most influential women in the country's public affairs for a quarter of a century. Life magazine said she was far and away the most important woman in American government. Her name was Anna Rosenberg. Her story has never been told before. I came over here from Europe at five, eight years old. She made her own way in a man's world. They were amazed, they were shocked, they were uh, troubled, they must be most of them were just a little bewildered. She was invited into the circle of a couple named Franklin and Eleanor. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And became an advisor and confidant to a president in peace and war. December 6, 1931, a date which will live in infamy. As the Cold War exploded into conflict, she was named to the highest position any woman had ever held in the American military. This is Rosenberg, wartime envoy of Presidents Roosevelt and Truman. Then, Joe McCarthy targeted her as a communist. Where a communist is concerned, she is not a free agent. Welcome everybody, thanks for coming out on this beautiful day, and thanks to the Western Museum, to, to Director Green, to the Museum Club, uh, to Sophia Sloan for, for introducing me, uh, really glad to be here. Um, Anna Rosenberg is a name that was famous in the 1940s and 1950s, she was on the cover of magazines that we would all recognize, Time and Life and the Saturday Evening Post, and she was in the New Yorker, she was in the New York Times. She was called by Life magazine, far and away the most important woman in American government in 1950, 51, 52, so by mid-century. Um, but virtually no one's heard of her, and we're, uh, when you leave today, you will have heard of her and, and might even uh, realize why she disappeared from history. It's kind of an interesting story. Her story begins in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, there she is in the middle. Uh, she has her mother, father, and, and grandparents are flanking her. Um, her father worked for the emperor, Franz Joseph who is the uncle of the Archduke who, whose assassination kicked off the First World War. And his father provided furnishings for the emperor for literally his palaces, and at one point uh, had to go around Europe and scour Europe for these furnishings at his own expense. When he delivered them to the emperor, the emperor broke the contract. And uh, Anna, Anna's father was ruined financially. And just a broken man. They've been a, a well-off family in, in Budapest, and now Albert Lederer, her father, had to leave Austro-Hungary, uh, Austro, the empire, and go to New York. He, like so many immigrants from all over the world, he you know, sailed under the Statue of Liberty, arrived in New York, got a job in the Lower East Side, and rebuilt his life. It took him two years, but after two years, he was able to, to call for his, his two daughters and, uh, and wife, and they joined him in New York. Um, and, that is sort of the beginning. This is in the years right before America's entry into World War I. By the time Anna got to the United States, her father had really become a, a super patriot. He, uh, you know, the American flag brought tears to his eyes. He, he couldn't wait to become a citizen so he could vote and participate in jury duty and, 
you know, the recite the Pledge of Allegiance was something that he, he really enjoyed doing because, you know, having come from this, this empire where voices were not heard, um, this was a whole new ballgame for him, and he was thrilled that he could be part of it, and he instilled in, these, in, in his daughter, Anna, these, this love of, of the United States, this love of America, and uh, for the rest of her life, she certainly had that love. Here's her and her sister. When they were processed at Ellis Island, uh, her, mother, her mother's Hungarian name was anglicized to Charlotte. Her sister, Clara, was anglicized to Claire. And when they got to, when they got to Anna, they said, do you want to be Anne? And she said, no, I'm going to be Anna. So she was very headstrong at a very young age. Like I said, her patriotism was almost instantaneous, and she wanted to know what she could do for her country, her adopted country, as it entered World War I in 1917. And what she did was, not only did she and her sister volunteer as Red Cross nurses, which you see here, Anna's in the foreground, but Anna sold Liberty Bonds on the street corners of New York. And I did the math, you know, for the book, and it was, you know, like hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of, in today's dollars, worth of Liberty Bonds. So she was quite a force to be reckoned with, even as a, as a teenager. She also was very interested at this young age in the suffrage movement. This is just a few years before women got the, the right to vote, and she would march along with, you know, other women and girls for the right to vote uh, up and down Broadway, and um, this is also the first time that she's appearing in the New York Times. She appeared in the New York Times for the first time in 1917 for being a, a leader of a, uh, mediating at the end of a student strike. Uh, what they wanted was the, the, the high school boys in New York City, they wanted to extend the school day so that they could go to military service after school. So if you were a football player or basketball player, you couldn't do that anymore. You had to you know, carry a, a wooden rifle and figure out how to march and so forth. So the boys uh, at these high schools went on strike Anna became, Anna Letterer at the time, became their student leader, their voice, and she actually was able to mediate that strike. She was in the New York Times, and the story actually made it all the way out to places like Vancouver, uh, Canada, and, uh, and Seattle, and, and sort of coast to coast. She got married young, Anna did, uh, at age 19 or so, to a veteran of World War I, uh, Mike Rosenberg. And Anna and Mike had a son named Thomas, and Anna started building her life, her career, uh, after high school. She did not attend college. She went immediately into starting her own business. And how she started her own business was through meeting a woman named Belle Moskowitz. Belle Moskowitz was sort of the de facto chief of staff of the governor of New York. And uh, Belle Moskowitz took the young Anna under her wing and taught her how to wield power, how to exercise power from behind the scenes, behind the curtain. And when Anna suggested that maybe labor relations or public relations might be a good fit for her, Val Moskowitz was very supportive of that and said, do it. And she did. Anna opened up a public relations and labor relations office, and she started to pioneer the art of mediation, which would be done at that time. It was either you're for the management or you're for the union, but not for both. And Anna as a mediator, became a voice for both sides. Her politics also, not only through Bell Moskowitz, but her political interests came from a man at Tammany Hall, the, the sort of the famous uh, New York political machine, this old Irishman named Jim Hagan. Um, they met in, in very interesting circumstances. He was giving a speech against women's suffrage, and Anna and her friends were in the back. And Anna stood up and, and gave him some lip, you know, sassed him. And instead of being angry with her after the meeting, he said, uh, let's meet and let's, let's talk. And he, too, took Anna under his wing. And so she sort of had a political mother in Bell Moskowitz and a political father in Jim Hagan. And here she is uh, on the right of your screen as one of the very first women in American history to manage her own political campaigns. Here she's managing a, a U.S. congressional campaign. When she was 28 years old, Anna was, uh, attended a tea uh, for the Democratic Party given by Eleanor Roosevelt. And Eleanor Roosevelt met the young woman and said, uh, what do you do for a living? And she said, well, I'm a labor relations person, I'm a mediator. 
And Eleanor Roosevelt said, well, my husband could use someone like that on his team. He's running for governor of New York. So Anna Rosenberg, at age 28, became in the Roosevelt's orbit and became part of the team along with Louis Howe and Francis Perkins that helped Franklin Delano Roosevelt win the governorship of New York State. Mm -hmm. Of course, they didn't know the Great Depression would happen the next year, 1929. And Roosevelt's plan to rebuild New York, uh, which was then scaled up for the nation, became the New Deal. So in 1933, 34, and 35, uh, he continued to use Anna Rosenberg, who was wonderful at every job she ever did for him, and she became the only woman director of these massive New Deal programs. She was responsible for New York State, including New York City, you know, the most populous city with the most businesses located there, not only for the National Recovery Act, but for the Social Security Act. She was the, the person in New York that translated policy from Washington to the people of New York who were um, signing up for Social Security for the very first time. And she would have women say to her, well, my husband doesn't know my true age, so I don't want to give it to you. And Anna said, Uncle Sam and I will keep your secrets. <laughs> After the, the New Deal gave way to uh, sort of the, the oncoming next World War, World War II, President Roosevelt was bedeviled by uh, a couple of things. One was not only the war was on the horizon, but his wife, who was very headstrong in her own way, Eleanor, and the mayor of New York, who's the man in the dark suit, Fiorello LaGuardia, were butting heads, and they were doing so publicly. And it was giving uh, Frank Roosevelt a black eye. So he again enlisted Anna, who's there in the middle, to uh, work with those two personalities, to bring them together, and to stop their, their fighting. And, and complaining in the newspapers so that he could get on with the business of preparing the United States for war. So she often found herself, quite literally in this case, between big personalities, bringing them together. Anna wore many hats, figurative, figuratively and, and literally. She was in fact famous for her hats. Here she is, she's about 41 or 42 years old. Franklin Roosevelt used to tease her about her hats and, uh, in a good natured way. They were very fancy, they were very ornate, as you can see. And the New Deal was this program that, you know, wasn't a uniform, cohesive thing. It was just, we're going to try this, and if it doesn't work, we're going to try that, and if it doesn't work, we're going to try something else. But the American people wanted just stuff to be tried, so that's what the New Deal became. So during the New Deal years, she's in Washington, and is with the other directors, there's 12 of them. Frank Roosevelt wheels in, and he takes a look at her hat, and he says, now, Anna, uh, what a wonderful hat you're wearing today, but I don't know whether you're coming or going. <laughs> and she says, well, Mr. President, it's a New Deal hat. <laughs> <laughs> Here she is wearing yet another hat. In 1942, no, I'll go back. In 1941, Roosevelt was, was presented with another problem. And that was the defense industries were already cranking up uh, for the, the war that we all knew was coming. But these good paying jobs were not being offered to black Americans. A. Philip Randolph, the black leader of the day, proposed a march on Washington uh, for equality. The problem for the Roosevelt White House was the threat of perhaps violence breaking out in Washington and the sort of the American caste system being revealed at the very moment we were going to fight fascism abroad. So he once again turned to the woman he was now calling his Mrs. Fixit, and he asked, bless you, he asked Anna Rosenberg to try and broker a deal between the, the black leadership and the White House. And she did. She was the, I argue in the book, the chief drafter of what became Executive Order 8802, which mandated the hiring of black Americans in the defense industries. Uh, historian David Kennedy calls that the first federal action towards civil rights since Reconstruction. So a, a monumental effort uh, by Anna. In 1942 or 43, her, her help, if, uh, uh, the Roosevelt administration took another turn. We think about the arsenal of democracy as something that you just flip a switch, and then all of a sudden, you know, Chrysler is building tanks, and Ford is building planes, and everything's fine. It wasn't like that. In 1942 and 43, 
the labor situation was very iffy and very dodgy. In fact, Eleanor Roosevelt complained about it in, in the newspapers. We had a surplus of workers in New York. We had uh, too few workers out on the West Coast. We had absenteeism. There was there was uh, worker there was piracy from from different parts of the, the defense industries. So the labor situation was far from settled. One of the key labor regions of the country, indeed the world at that time, was Buffalo, Niagara, because they built everything. Tanks, planes, ordnance, parachutes. And you could get those on the Great Lakes and ship them to the Atlantic Ocean and get them over to the Allies. The labor problem in Buffalo was a disaster. They were short almost 100,000 workers. The contracts were being broken. Uh, the Allies weren't getting the equipment that they needed. The Americans weren't able to stockpile the stuff we needed. So once again, Roosevelt calls on his Mrs. Fixit. She became the labor czar of Buffalo, Niagara, and she knew immediately that more women needed to be involved, and not just single women. It was married women, married with children. She knew that they needed uh, to have the parks opened and heated at 2 or 3 in the morning. Movie theaters needed to be uh, kept open. So, black Americans, women, high school students pitched in, um, disabled Americans pitched in, and she was able to put together almost 100,000 workers, which satisfied those requirements of the contracts and helped the arsenal of democracy fire on all cylinders. And then we'll, we'll pause it there and let, um, I want to hear from the, I'm going to just peek at this here for the museum club. We'll take some Q&A too. Um, we'll take some Q&A too at the end, but maybe we'll um, hand it over here to the museum club and let them ask a couple of questions here. Sure. Uh, first of all, we wanted to ask, how did Anna Rosenberg's experiences and trials as a young woman in New York City prepare her for enduring success in business and politics? I think it was those formative experiences with both Jim Hagan of Tammany Hall. <coughs> he was into retail politics. You have to knock on doors. You have to pick up the phone a, a hundred times, a thousand times. And also Bell Moskowitz, who showed this young woman that women who just had the right to vote in 1920 could actually move the needle politically. They didn't even need elected office to do so, although that was on the horizon too. They just needed to sort of have the data and have the, uh, the ability to work behind the scenes. And also with the idea that they would then transition you know, into elected office themselves. So those two lessons were very formative and, and held her in good stead throughout her career. So Anna Rosenberg recognized a link between social equality and a stronger democracy. How did her actions support the civil rights for black Americans and for American women? The story in Buffalo, I think, is very instructive about that. It was not only bringing women on board, uh, but black Americans and black women. And she said to the black press at the time, this is 1942, she said, when you, when you make these gains, when you, make these, when you get these jobs and you make these gains, consolidate your gains because then you can take a step further. As pertains to women, her philosophy throughout World War II as it pertains to women was American women need to sacrifice like the men. The, maybe not on the battlefield, I mean, we're not gonna be carrying a, a, a rifle, but to punch in, in the line, one of the lines in the book, to punch in and punch back. To work in the defense industries, the midnight shift. To get off work at five in the morning. Um, and to, you know, to, to make the sacrifices. What, what Anna's philosophy was is if American women sacrificed alongside the men, they would garner more social equality. That was, that was her philosophy. Whether that turned out to be the case, um, I discuss a little in a little more detail in the book, but her philosophy was certainly, this is all hands on deck. She knew almost immediately. And I think Americans didn't quite realize that. Uh, Roosevelt certainly did, Anna Rosenberg certainly did, that this was a new kind of war. It wasn't just men on the battlefield against each other. It was societies against each other. It was everybody. You know, Russian women were in combat, to give you a sense of, of how you know, women were, were uh, in World War II. But American women, you know, they built the Boeings that bombed the enemy cities. 
They built the, 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 you know, the ordnance. They built uh, so many of the uh, pieces of equipment that the Allies needed and the United States needed. Instrumental in the war. Uh, what was it about Anna Rosenberg's personality that made her a trusted friend to not only FDR, but Presidents Truman, um, Ellis Howard, Eisenhower, and um, John? So what was it about her personality that not only allowed her to be the confidant of Franklin Roosevelt, but also Presidents Truman, uh, General Eisenhower, and then President Eisenhower? Um, to answer this question, I, I do want to read a little tiny bit from the book, but um, she was genuine. When you go back to her labor mediation, one of the really fun things about the research was to hear that the union guys, teamsters, truckers, guys that drove milk trucks, um, respected her. They said, you know, when Anna tells us something, she, we know she's on the level. And not only did the union man, the union men uh, trust her and respect her, but the business owners did as well. One, one you know, titan of industry said, had I gone to her you know, a little bit sooner, I would have saved myself $10,000. Nelson Rockefeller was one of two Rockefeller brothers that she mentored. Nelson Rockefeller, at the end of his life, he, he'd been governor of New York four times, he'd been the vice president of the United States. He said, everything I've ever amounted to in Washington, I owe to Anna Rosenberg. So she was able to be respected and trusted by not only a Rockefeller, but also by you know, a guy that drove a milk truck in New York City. And it was a genuineness. You know, if she was talking to you, you were the only person in the world. And those amazing leaders, Roosevelt, Truman, and, and Eisenhower, and Johnson, all saw that in her, that genuineness. Um, this is where I did forget one pair of glasses, but fortunately I did not forget this pair. I'm going to read just a very, very short bit, also in answer to your question, about what made it made her tick, what made her seven job Anna, Mrs. Fix It, the confidant. Um, it's 1941. America's not quite in the war yet. She's at the top of yet another uh, civilian defense agency, and there's all. It was called the Office of Defense, Health, and Welfare. Her assistant was a young David Rockefeller. And I'll just read. Uh, assisted by David Rockefeller, Nelson's younger brother, Anna was given emergency powers to ensure adequate transportation, housing, schooling, health facilities, and public safety for the, quote, swollen towns and expanded military bases in New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware. Once a month, Anna and her staff met with military, municipal, and industry leaders in the ballroom of the Hotel Astor in Times Square. Perched on the stage was Anna and her staff. On the long table sat two telephones, a black one and a red one. The red one, she said, was a direct line to the White House. The monthly meeting started with a recap of the last meeting's priorities. And this is Anna speaking. David, where's our list? OK, now, Admiral, last month you promised you would soon have more housing at your Navy Yard, yes? Well, Mrs. Rosenberg, you see, not yet, Admiral. Am I seeing that housing? Well, no, Mrs. Rosenberg, that's a problem. We can't get enough lumber. Anna grabbed the red phone. Anna Rosenberg here. Is he there? Good. Fine. Listen. Admiral Smith says, thanks. See you soon. Goodbye, darling. It took just a minute. According to David Rockefeller's assistant, in the several meetings I attended, I was unable to ascertain whether the red phone was actually connected to any terminal, <laughs> let alone one at the White House. Nevertheless, the missing lumber, the elusive plumbing, or the scarce medical supplies uh, somehow soon appeared where needed. <laughs> and that's what she did for Roosevelt, for Truman, for General and then President Eisenhower, for Senator, Congressman, Senator, and then Vice President, and then President Johnson. Um, I asked her son, uh, her grandson, Thomas, uh, about that. And about, you know, a lot of times there are figures that are maybe the confidant of one person, but so rarely four or five. And he said she had the ability to, because of her talent and her skill to get, and she was a wonderful listener, she was a good storyteller, she was witty, she was charming. She could get into the rooms of power, but she had the social graces to stay there. And that's something that I think in our politics today, <laughs> we don't see enough of. Yeah. But um, 
both uh, Democrat and Republican, I should, I should also mention, um, she was respected by both sides um, at the Senate level, and, and indeed, you know, President, President Eisenhower, of course. Um, in fact, his pivot from soldier to statesman was uh, aided uh, substantially by Anna Rosenberg and her second husband. So she was urged to write her memoirs by Eleanor Roosevelt and leading publishing houses. And Edward R. Murrow once told her, you have quite a book to write someday. So why did she resist writing these memoirs? Such a great question. It's, it's on everybody's mind who learns about Anna Rosenberg, learns that she was famous once and not famous now, and, and why? And why is there no book about her? It, it's true. Eleanor Roosevelt tried to put her in touch, wrote a letter saying, here's the guy, and here's a biographer. I want you to, to reach out. I read so many letters between Anna Rosenberg and Eleanor Roosevelt, and they're loving. They're, they're so full of respect and admiration. There was never a birthday that, that Anna didn't send Eleanor Roosevelt a hat or a box of candies or a bunch of flowers. But in that letter, Anna was, she, she didn't snap at Eleanor Roosevelt, but she was very, very terse. Uh, I have no, no interest in meeting this person. Um, not, didn't want to do it. And the question is why? Edward R. Murrow said, you have quite a book to write. Why did she not? The, the one thing that, as people learn again about Anna Rosenberg, is, of course, the, the name that she shared with the atomic spies, uh, Ethel Julius. And it happened at the very apex of Anna's career, when she was in the Pentagon, 1950, was literally the year that the New York Rosenbergs, there was no relation whatsoever. In fact, Rosenbergs around the country were shunned and lost friends and lost jobs. But the couple in New York were arrested in 1950 and then executed in 1953. Literally, Anna was in the Pentagon in 1950 and left the Pentagon in 1953. Same exact years. So that played a role in her not wanting to trumpet her own accomplish accomplishments. But that desire to not trumpet her own accomplishments even went before that. Anna was not one uh, to, you know, she loved, loved is maybe a strong word, she parried with the newspaper reporters. She posed for their photographs. But when she was in the newspapers, it was never about her. It was always about the leader that she venerated or the issue that she was working on or the, the people under her that were doing the, the hard work to get things right. So it was never about her. And lastly, um, well, she also didn't have a college education. So you think about Frances Perkins who went to Penn and Columbia and Penn and Columbia raised her up as sort of the architect of the New Deal. Anna Rosenberg doesn't have that. She got a few honorary degrees, but she did not have a college or, or you know, let alone an elite university sort of trumpet her for her. And lastly, it, it, it goes back to um, all those 137, 145 meetings with Franklin Roosevelt, one-on-one, -on -one, more than most cabinet members, during World War II, where they would talk over meals uh, in the Oval Office or in the President's study. They would, uh, she would sneak in you know, chicken paprika to the President, because as some of, you, some of you may know, Eleanor Roosevelt was not much of a cook. Uh, as wonderful as a human being she was, she was not a very good cook. She would make scrambled eggs. They would have dinner together, they would have lunches together, and they would the president would de-stress. He would tell stories, and she would laugh, and then she would tell stories, and he would laugh, and they would also solve problems that were bedeviling the country during World War II. And after everybody left the White House, everybody went and wrote a memoir, and Anna just thought that was distasteful. She, she didn't like it. Um, there were, I think there's a footnote in the book, there might be 30 memoirs that I list in a big, long footnote. Anna Rosenberg did not want to do that. Um, she was the confidant. And what she'd been told by these presidents was in confidence. And she did not think that it was her place uh, to sell books uh, you know, by, by putting these conversations in between the covers. Um, so I know there's lots of reasons there, but it's a long answer. But why haven't we heard of Anna Rosenberg? There's some compelling reasons why, why we haven't. But um, we do have the book now. <laughs> <laughs> How are we doing on questions? Okay. We're good. All right. Well, let's. We just have a few more images here. Um, let's scroll ahead. We talked quite a lot about World War II. She went 
We'll pause it there for one sec. Um, in 1944, President Roosevelt sent her, if you can believe it, a civilian woman sent her to the battlefields of France only weeks after D-Day. She followed General Patton's army as it raced across France and slept on the, in the tents. She was you know, on the cold ground. She ate rations off the hood of the Jeep. She shared conversations with the men as they were taking pictures out of their helmets to show her. And they shared their dreams for the post-war, should they be lucky enough to return home. And she filled out notebook after notebook after notebook. When she was able to sit down and, and look at what she'd written, she found something that surprised her. The men wanted an education. They didn't want to learn how to operate a new factory machine when they got back. They wanted an education. You know, this generation of Great Depression and then war had really never dreamed of going to college. That was the, the, that was the privilege of the wealthy. Millions of GIs wanted that opportunity. They wanted a piece of the America they were helping to save. And she was delighted to find that out. And she was delighted to tell President Roosevelt that when she got back. And she said he lit up. He was thrilled that this was the case. And if you look at the, it was after he died, of course, but the provisions that were added on to the GI Bill in 46 and 47 were almost entirely educational in nature. And it, it elevated you know, millions of people into the American middle class. And the GI Bill uh, owes a, a debt of gratitude to Anna Rosenberg's uh, work uh, with the troops back in 1944. She's in a forward area here. Uh, this is with General Walker, and we'll go one more. Now, does anyone, this is a tricky one because he might look like two people. Does anyone recognize who this general is? General Patton. It's Patton. General Patton. She called him Georgie. They had a good relation. Uh, Patton, when she arrived at his forward area, though, his dog bit her. His wife is from Lowell. Is that so? I didn't know that. General Patton's wife is from Lowell. When Patton got to Metz, he was going so fast that he went faster than his petroleum and his, he ran out of gas, essentially. But when he got to Metz, which is on the frontier between France and Germany, that's where Anna was pinned. She was actually pinned down by uh, sniper fire. Uh, so this was, she was not a VIP, you know, addressing the troops at one remove. She was with the troops. And she did the same uh, when she went to Korea. In October of 1945, only several weeks after the end of World War II, after the dropping of the atomic bombs and the surrender of the Japanese, Anna was the first American, man or woman, to be awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, which she's being awarded here. Very proud moment. Here she is. She has one of many photographs of her and Truman where they're both all smiles, which I love. Um, Truman uh, respected her work too. This is in regards to uh, Truman's decision to desegregate the armed forces and the federal government. And what he's holding is a report that the folks surrounding him had worked on. And that helped him make that decision, that very courageous decision, to desegregate the armed forces with the executive order. Her cherished picture of Roosevelt's over her shoulder. She had, in her career, three phones on her desk. She was, you know, that's who she was. Seven Job Anna was a common nickname. And Sophie, why don't you read that for us? I'm not a crusader or a reformer, but there are a lot of things happening you cannot just sit by watching idly. I decided to do something about it. A lesson for all citizens. The New Deal, Roosevelt Governor, Roosevelt New Deal, Roosevelt President, World War II, that was just Anna's first act. Because in 1950, she was retired from government service, mostly. She was at her apartment in New York, and she was opening the mail. She was obviously working at her career in public relations, but she was opening the mail, and she opened up a letter from General George C. Marshall, you know, the architect of American victory in World War II. 
And it was an extraordinary letter. It said, Anna, I hope you can see your way to do this. I need you to come down to the Pentagon to be my number two and to help me rebuild the size and strength of the U.S. Army, which has been decimated by budget cuts since World War II. We have occupied West Germany. We have to occupy Japan. We're trying to contain communism in Eastern Europe. And now there's this disastrous war that started in Korea. Please come down and join me. She had to leave her business, which she had only just uh, begun to sort of bring back into uh, uh, profitability. She had to leave the apartment that she had only just then purchased after renting for decades. But she went back down to Washington <coughs> and became the right-hand assistant to this man, General Marshall, who is the Secretary of Defense. And she spent 26 months at the Defense Department, um, not only going to Korea twice, so let's flip back once. <coughs> Before she, well, she did have an interim appointment. So she's working at the Pentagon. She pushed that big wooden door open, and you know her legendary long days commenced. But then Joe McCarthy, Senator Joe McCarthy, uh, realized that there was still a full Senate confirmation that needed to take place. So Senator McCarthy and a, and a uh, radio star named Fulton Lewis put together a, or tried to put together a smear campaign to label Anna Rosenberg as a communist. Their main, uh, their, their, their chief weapon against Anna Rosenberg was a man that they found in New York who would testify that he had been at a communist meeting back in the 1930s and there was an Anna Rosenberg in that meeting. Now, you know where this is going. Anna Rosenberg had the New York City phone book. So she, you know, how many Anna Rosenbergs were in the, the New York City phone book? 47, because it's Joe Smith in New York City, right? So, lo and behold, they found the, the communist Anna Rosenberg. She was living out in California. Um, this Anna Rosenberg, of course, was a lifelong patriot and uh, uh, anti-communist. Here she is being sworn in as Assistant Secretary of Defense. Two trips to Korea. The first winter... She saw what the men were going through, she saw the conditions, and she said no person, no troop, most, no uh, GI in Korea will spend a second winter in Korea. And that was the beginning of the point system, where, where servicemen could get points and then cycle out, go back to the United States, go back home, and then be reinforced. Instead of World War II style, where it was, you know, whole divisions would just be there until the job was done and only then come back. The men loved her for that. With the exception of a few technicians, not one soldier spent two winters in Korea. So the men really, really uh, loved what she was doing for them. She was a, a friend of the soldiers, a friend of the GI. You see in this photograph integrated troops. Of course, Truman had integrated or desegregated the armed forces uh, just a few years before. When Anna Roseberg got to the Pentagon, she realized that the schools on the bases were still segregated. The schools in, in the South, Army-based schools, were still segregated. So the sons and daughters of those black soldiers could not go to school with white children. And she put an end to that. She twisted arms at the civilian level, the military level. She took on the office, uh, it wasn't the Department of Education yet, but she took on the Office of Education and saw to it that those bases were desegregated. And this was the year before Brown versus, Brown versus Board. So it was actually... The military schools were desegregated before the public schools of America. When she first got to Korea, a journalist said, how many black troops are serving? She said, that's not the question. How many American troops are serving? And keep going. Another hat. <laughs> When I was doing the research, one of the most uh, interesting sort of files was the letters between the GIs and their parents and Anna. So here she is with the sergeant. The, the men loved her. Uh, next to, um, she was Miss Wolfhound 1952 for one unit. Uh, she beat out Doris Day and Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> she, uh, one of the letters, it, it might be my favorite thing of all, she got a Valentine's Day card from like three or four GIs signed it. And they knew it was awkward. They said, you know, dear Mrs. Rosenberg, this is a little bit weird, but this is the only card we could get at the PX. <laughs> so they sent her a Valentine's Day card. 
Um, when she got back, not only in World War II, but when she got back from the trips in Korean War, she would spend days writing the mothers and fathers of the men that she met. You know, putting on weight, they have a nice tan, the mustache is coming in good. Um, a little personal touch of each and every GI. Their parents would write to her and say, wow, what a, you know, what a, what a difference that visit made. And one, one uh, mother offered to send her a ham. So she said, you know, you've done a remarkable thing for my son, I'm gonna send you a ham, and, and she wrote, Anna wrote back, um, I thank you for the sentiment, please do not send me a ham. <laughs> These two go way back, who's the man on the right? Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson, congressman in 1937. He's in a special election down in Texas. He, it's like the eve of the election, he's short money. Who gave him 500 bucks? Anna Rosenberg. $500 in 1937. A lot of money. He never forgot that. They were friends from that day forward. They, had a, a, they shared a vision for what the country could be. Uh, and he, as he rose up through the ranks, a uh, tremendous amount of respect on both sides. Here he is trying to give her the Johnson treatment, but it's not working too well. <laughs> The one president who didn't use, use Anna Rosenberg in the service of the government as much as he might have is, is John F. Kennedy. He saw her primarily as a fundraiser, which she was also excellent at. But Eleanor Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt rather, had suggested to John Kennedy to bring her on at the cabinet level. It was time. You know, the previous presidencies had all had, had women on the, on the cabinet. You know, Francis Perkins and Ovetta Kulpavi. And in 1960, it seemed like this would, of course, be this would continue. Maybe even have two women on the cabinet, or maybe have a, a woman on the Supreme Court. But it was not to be. Kennedy, the Kennedy administration was, it was all male affair, all, all, all men, uh, for the most part. There were no women of any real decision-making power during the Kennedy years. The loyal Democrat that she was, uh, the loyal American that she was, she raised funds for Kennedy including co-hosting his 1962 birthday gala at Madison Square Garden. That's Kennedy, uh, you can see, and next to him is Anna Rosenberg. Anna Rosenberg and her co-host put together the list of entertainers, uh, Ella Fitzgerald, Danny Kaye, there was a, a ballet troupe, um, and then of course the last performer was to be Marilyn Monroe. After the party, the birthday party at Madison Square Garden, they all went back to the Crims, uh, Arthur Crim and Matilda Crim's apartment in New York. And it was here that the only photograph of Robert Kennedy, John Kennedy, and Marilyn Monroe was taken. In the Korean War, Anna came back after one of her visits and she said, uh, someone asked her, what do the men want? And she said, they all asked me for Marilyn Monroe. Will they, will they send her over to entertain the troops? And um, Marilyn Monroe was in L.A. and she read this in the newspaper and she said, Mrs. Rosenberg wants me to go to Korea. Uh, I'm, I'm certainly in favor of doing that. So in 1954, Marilyn Monroe did go to Korea and entertain the troops, but um, obviously can't go to sad end. Here we are in 1962 and she will be dead in a matter of uh, a couple of months from the date of this photograph. Hmm. And Sophie, you want to take that, take that away? And you have quite a book to write someday. Yes, and remember, I'm a great journalist. I think now would be uh, a good time for some questions from you nice people. Yeah. yeah. How did she learn about Lyndon Johnson and give him that five hundred? What did she see in him? Or, uh, yes. I. I it's, a, it's in the book, but um, she, she, he was on the radar screen. It, it, was not, it, it wasn't a last minute thing. Um, young congressman, uh, or young congressional, uh, it wasn't a congressman, but the young man running for Congress was on her radar screen as someone who had the New Deal bona fides. They knew that even at that young age that he was gonna come to Washington and be one of them, and meaning one of the, 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 the died the wool New Dealers. And when he did come to Washington, he obviously wanted to meet the big man. He wanted to meet the boss. And to do that, he had to go through Anna. And then he met Roosevelt. And Roosevelt loved the guy. You know, they, they were, and they would talk 
Linda Johnson and Anna would write letters to each other into the 1960s talking about their shared love of Franklin Roosevelt. Yeah. yeah. So was she part of the civil rights movement in the 60s? In a way, yes. Uh, she, when Johnson was tinkering with making the draft more fair, it was black Americans make up 10% of the population but 25% of the casualties in Vietnam. She was part of a commission that gave him the data so that he could make the draft more fair, both, both in terms of social economics and race. So that was, you know, the, you know, maybe the not too many, you know, tighten up on the college deferments so that the, 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 the burden of war would be borne by everybody, not just the, the folks at the bottom of the social economic ladder. She was lifelong, lifelong commitment to civil rights. I mean, from Paul Robeson back in the 20s and 30s, through A. Philip Randolph and Walter White in the 40s, uh, all the way up to working with Johnson on, on that in the 1960s. Yeah. Yeah. Did she work on the GI Bill? What she did was she brought back data, which was then folded into the additions that were grafted onto the GI Bill in 45, 46, 47. A bill that size, like the Affordable Care Act, we're still, it's 20 years old or 15 years old or however old it is, we're still adding and deleting stuff from that bill. So the GI Bill was passed in June of 1944, but uh, it needed to be administrated. So her data that she brought back to Franklin Roosevelt put the GI Bill on the trajectory of education at the maybe expense of the trajectory of vocation. You know, these guys want to go to college, they want to go to grad school. Because yeah. weren't, weren't black Americans omitted from the GI Bill? That's a sad fact. That's, you're, you're absolutely right. The, the benefits, both in terms of housing, uh, you know, this, all these guys went and they bought homes, low, low interest uh, mortgages to get themselves into the suburbs. And black Americans were not given that same opportunity, both educationally uh, and uh, in terms of, of the home uh, ownership. You're absolutely right. Have some more questions. I'm a teacher. There we go. <laughs> That's what I do. So, having just discovered Anna Rosenberg, how did how did you discover Mrs. Rosenberg, and what made you want to write this book? Because it sounds like you had a lot of interest in this book. Yeah. What was it about her that said this is going to be my first book? It was she had a zealot would be one way to describe it, but like an in, intentional Forrest Gump would be another. You know, <laughs> what surprised me so much was that I was able. I had like these lily pads. You know, here she is, Giada. Here she is doing something that relates to the arsenal of democracy. But I was able to sort of step from lily pad to lily pad pretty easily because she was just in everything. You know, all these pivot points of history, from suffrage all the way through like the Vietnam War, she was there, and she was not just there, but at the heart, in many ways, at the, at the heart of decisions that that had long-term ramifications for the country, mostly beneficial. Yeah, yeah. So that was a. A surprise to me, but a pleasant one. So I was able to put together the narrative of a whole career. Yes? Yeah. Questions? Let's have more questions. There we go. I'm a plant. Did, <laughs> didn't uh, your discovery of Anna have something to do with your role at Westford Academy? As oh, a what a great question, American young lady. <laughs> <laughs> a great question, young lady. Um, you remember the picture where she's having a laugh with President Truman? Yeah. I, it wasn't that picture, but it was a picture very much like that one. And underneath it said, Anna Rosenberg with President Harry Truman. Uh, no, it said Anna Rosenberg, comma, Assistant Secretary of Defense with President Truman. And I thought, oh, that's the Assistant Secretary of Defense? She's not wearing, you know, olive drab or uniform. And who is this person? We've heard of Frances Perkins, obviously Eleanor Roosevelt and others, but so I put her on my list for students to research for their junior research paper, and a couple of students chose her. Then they come to me, and they can't find a book. There's no book. And I, I was flabbergasted. I'm like, how can there not be a book? This is the civilian woman, you know, stylish civilian woman at the very top of the, of the, the Pentagon, the military establishment. There should be a book about her. There wasn't. We found that her papers were at Harvard, so my wife, Elizabeth, <laughs> we went down to the, we went down to the Schlesinger Library and met these uh, students and the librarians bring out the, the carts with the you know the boxes of documents and everything and we opened them up and 
one of the one of the girls says, Mr. Gorham, come here. And I mean, she had just opened the top, and there's you know handwritten citation from Harry Truman and handwritten stuff from Franklin Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt, General Eisenhower, you know, Congressman Johnson, Senator Johnson, President Johnson, Lady Bird Johnson, Mimi Eisenhower. Um, you know, a matchbook with Eleanor Roosevelt's writing on it. You know, a business card with with Eleanor saying, you know, meet me, meet me for lunch next time you're in New York. It was just wow. You know, it was it was it was just kind of a lightning bolt, and uh, I decided to write the book. I think that day, right then. Um, so there's a WA connection, um, which is just uh, pretty wonderful. Yeah. 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 Any other questions out there? Do you have a focus of interest for your next book? I do, but all I'm going to say, all I'm going to say is the, uh, the the book tour events like this and events on Zoom are going to take up my going to take up my time uh, in addition to my teaching duties for the for the upcoming several months. But there will be another one. Yeah. Yes. I've always been interested in Wendell Wilkie. Did they cross paths at all? Ooh, 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 ooh. He uh, was an ally at the end later on. Yes. Yeah. I don't think he's in. I don't think Wendell Wilkie's in the index. Um, so I don't, I did not come across Anna Rosenberg crossing the paths with him, no. Okay. No. Um, the decision to make Truman the vice president, though, because there was a man named Jimmy Burns that was sort of the heir apparent. Roosevelt asked Anna to tell Jimmy Burns the bad news. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, it was, you know, very, she didn't want to do it. The, Jim, Jim Burns had been Supreme Court Justice, he'd been in Congress, he'd been the Vice President, um, and now uh, the decision was made to get rid of him and, and swap him out with Harry Truman. Um, and it mostly is because Jimmy Burns was from South Carolina and his record on race was not wonderful, whereas Truman's record was okay. So Harry Truman became the Vice President. I think you know most of us, or all of us, are grateful for it. Yeah. Rick, good to see you. Yes, same here. <laughs> oh, I have a question. <laughs> was it difficult to sustain this book tour while you were also um, teaching at Westford Academy? <laughs> I happen to know firsthand it's a difficult job in itself. You know, when I was in my fantasies of sort of being a published author, I was like, you know, I'm going to be traveling and going to all these events. I love Zoom. Let's just, I, I'm yeah. now a Zoom guy. Like, let's just do it on Zoom. So thank, thank goodness for that, because that way I can be efficient with my time. But uh, yeah, yeah, I will be taking a one semester sabbatical starting in, at the end of this school year. So, uh, so I'll be back with renewed vigor next February. What, while I was asking a question, and I, I asked you this before, but I think for the benefit of the rest of the group, it's pretty impressive. What did it take for you to write this book? <laughs> well, I, I was saying up, up here, um, this is my student Emily at Fitzpatrick and her mother. I was saying um, I learned all the lessons the hard way because I'm a first timer. So, like, I, I did the wrong proposed chapter. I had to rewrite that. Um, my chapters were too long. My chapters were too boring. They, I just, all the lessons were learned the hard way. And then I don't know what day it was or what week it was or even what month it was, but it, I wrote a chapter that was like, okay, just. Do this, but do it 20 more times, <laughs> and, um, and that's kind of how it went. So then I was just okay. You know, I'd sit at the the table at our house uh, in the morning and, and uh, on weekends and and write. You know, from about seven to one, and just continue doing that month after month after month. And uh, yeah, but I I found the recipe at one point about halfway through the process, and then just replicated it. Yeah, that's good. great. Thank you. So how long did it take you? How long was the process? The whole process started April, April 2019. I find the documents. One year later, I had an agent. One year later, we had a book deal. So that's April of 21. Then it took, then it takes like another, from April of 21 essentially to March of 23 to build the book, put it together, get rights to all the photographs. Edit it a kajillion times. <laughs> you know, there's a million different editors. Uh, so yeah, that's that's kind of how it works. Any other questions? Yes. Did you say she fell out of favor? Somehow? Why did we not ever hear about her? So when she was asked to, people like Eleanor Roosevelt and Edward R. Murrow, the journalist, 
thought, you know, we need to know about this person. You need to put down your, your memoir. You need to write your, your autobiography. And she wasn't interested in doing that. Uh, part of, she was not embarrassed by her name, but the name Rosenberg was not, not the kind of name you wanted to see on a book coming out in 1953. And also, she, she thought that she'd been told things in confidence by these presidents, and she didn't want to cash in on that, if you will. But she's been gone for 40 years, so it's time for Americans to learn anew about her remarkable career. Yes? Yeah, on that note, have you been in touch with the Smithsonian about the women's museum that they're... Is it the virtual one? The, I, pitched, I pitched the Smithsonian to try and get an excerpt in, um, which hasn't worked so far. So if you know anyone at the Smithsonian, <laughs> if you have any connections. Um, I, I should do, if they have a, a museum, whether it's virtual or, or brick and mortar, I, I will definitely pitch them, yeah. Um, uh, going to the FDR library at the end of this month, um, which is going to be a real uh, treat for me, because I haven't been there since I was 13 or 14 years old, oh, so it's going to be amazing. Uh, yeah. Wonderful questions, thank you. Any other last minute questions? Who designed your book cover? The um, her name, her name is in the, very catchy. Funny it's great, they did a nice job, yeah, yeah. Um, and Linda, do you have some of these on hand? We certainly do. <laughs> <laughs> well. We do have copies of um, Chris's book to sell right over there. Denise is in the sitting right beside them. And um, you'll be autographing them? Yes, I will. Yeah. Happy to do that. And describing a, a woman named Joanna Segola did the cover design. But um, very nice, very handsome.